Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Reimagining Abhinavanath Institution and Beyond. To begin with, the welcome address will be given by Mr. Shottokam Shen for my welcome to this session. Thank you. Namaskar and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a privilege for me to deliver the welcome address in this seminar named Re-Imaging Abhinavanath Institution and Beyond. For this opportunity, I must convey my sincere thanks and gratitude to the authorities of Indian Museum and the Government College of Art and Craft, Calcutta. As we know that as a pioneer and an exponent in Indian art, Abhinavanath Tagore is remembered for his invaluable contributions towards building up the Swadeshi values in Indian art, which he founded as the first major exponent and which subsequently bloomed out to the influential Bengal School of Art paving way to the development of modern Indian painting. As a literateur, his creations, particularly for the children, is no less than creating art. It is evident in his way of storytelling and presenting a unique way of illustrations. His books like Raj Kahini, Puro Angla, Nalok and Khire Kutul are the landmarks of literature in that way. This afternoon, to be enlightened more on him, we are blessed to have these eminent speakers like Dr. Tapoti Gothakurata, an eminent historian and director and professor, Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Dr. Jayaram Paduval, assistant professor, MS University, Baroda. Dr. Shomik Nondi Mojumdar, a senior faculty, Kala Bhavan, Vishwabharati. A warm welcome to all of them to this webinar. My sincere welcome to Professor Chhatrapati Dattu, the principal of Government College of Art and Craft, as a moderator of the session. I welcome the august audience, both from the aesthetic world and the sphere of museums, and the area of culture, the connoisseurs, educationists, and other distinguished guests. My earnest welcome to the faculty member and pupils of Government Art College and other such institutions, Indian Museum staff members, and museum professionals of other such organizations who are present in this webinar. I wish a grand success to this webinar titled Re-Imaging Abhinavanath Institution and Beyond, organized by the Indian Museum Kolkata in collaboration with the Government College of Art and Craft, Calcutta. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sen. And to again begin with, and being an institution, it will be uh, on behalf of the students, Niladri Mojumdar, who will be presenting a small address. Welcome, Niladri. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, respected principal, sir, teachers, the director, and the members of the Indian Museum, Kolkata, eminent speakers, and my dear friends. I am Niladri Mojumdar, presently a student of seventh semester, BFA at the Government College of Art and Craft, Calcutta. On behalf of all students, I would like to say a few words to commemorate the great master. Born on the 7th of August, 1871, in the Jorashaku Thakurbari, Abhinjanath Tagore is widely hailed as the father of modern Indian art and is best known as the foundational figure of the Bengal School of Art. 
He revived Indian art, which for ages lay decadent and hidden from the public eye. Abhinandranath was not only a versatile artist, his role as a teacher, interpreter, commentator, and author takes him beyond categorizations. We know of the occasional painting lessons he got from O. Giladi and Charles Palmer from his writings in Jora Shakurthari, having developed skills in the Western academic style of painting in his early years, Abhinandranath was inducted as the vice principal of the Government School of Art on August 15, 1905 by Ernest Winfield Havel. He held the post till 1950. Even though he did not have any formal training, Havel recognized Abhinandranath's genius and allowed him to do things in his own way. Mughal and Pahari miniatures were his sources of inspiration as he believed that they were expressive of India's distinct spirituality as opposed to the materialism of the West. Milaji, your microphone has gone off. Sorry, sir. Yeah, start from Sorry, the last. Okay, okay, yes. Abhinandranath was also influenced by Japanese traditional painting. Together, Abhinandranath and Havel attempted to reform art education by laying emphasis on Indian traditions. This eventually gave birth to the Bengal School of Art. The Bengal School ushered in a spirit of revivalism and nationalism into the Indian art scene. Through a persuasive anti-colonial stand, the issues of national identity got a new face to his paintings like Bharatman. Imbued with the essential power in his works, created a unique visual world rich in romanticism. His Krishna Leela series, Arabian Nights, The Passing of Shah Jahan, and illustrations of Umar Khayyam and several others be a testimony to his relentless creative pursuit. Though he was being stigmatized as a revivalist, he built up a visual world of his own, which enlivens in his Kudur Jatra a pictorial reconstruction of Ramayana that he created for his grandson. His Katun Kutum, the unique sculptural forms that he made with found digital objects, and in his gamut of writings in the form of stories, plays, etc. The Bichitra Club, founded by Abhinandranath, along with his ingenious brothers, Gobanandranath Tagore and Shamarandranath Tagore, stood as a space for cosmopolitan interactions. Thinkers and artists like Kakuzo Okakura, Yokoyama Taikan, and Tampo Arai shared views within the Tagore's premises. Abhinandranath Tagore sowed the seeds for independent artistic approaches and a sense of autonomy among his students, which are still valued today encouraging many future artists and pedagogues. As students of the Government College of Art and Craft, Calcutta, we look at the Department of Indian Painting where the legacy of Abhinandranath is still continuing and the cultural heritage of Indian painting is being preserved by this unique department. We are looking forward to the inaugural session of free imaging Abhinandranath, institution and beyond to understand the great master in new ways through introspective views of our eminent speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Miladri. Thank you very much. That the Indian Museum and the Government College of Art and Craft, Calcutta, is in collaboration to mark the 150th anniversary of Avalinath Tagore, not only relives a long association between the two institutions, it, is also, it also rekindles the promises of, a more meaningful, of more meaningful events in the times to come. Reimaging Obanulinath itself is a year-long endeavor designed to be a celebration of this multifaceted stalwart through webinars, workshops, and discussions. It has been customary to celebrate the Tithi of Obanulinath's birthday which is the day of Janmashtami. That we begin this occasion today has thus been a matter of choice. The core idea of revisiting Abhinandranath 
is not merely a celebration of the life and works of one of the greatest minds of the modern Indian art scene, but to make it a sincere and honest effort to relearn from the crucial social and political trajectories of the 19th and early 20th century that has shaped our world and our art practices today. It is to understand that in the midst of a dominated colonized state, as artists, art educators, and art thinkers, if the question of indigenous practices would not have been enli enlivened when they were, if an alternative was not painfully sought after, if the review of our traditions would not have culminated into a distinct departure from the prevalent, prevalent moribund institutional practices, what would the concurrent future of art practice and what would it have, what practices been and what future would it have left for us today? To be able to ask and address the rightful questions of today and not to falter in the face of odds that are mere glass palaces. It is important to be, to be able to trace the innovative routes taken by the un uncompromising mind of this diehard protagonist of independent thought and expression, which is driven in spite of all inner contradictions and external antagonisms towards a singular destination, that of arriving at a visual language shaped and draped with the body and mind born from the ethos of his own land, the spirit of which he understood so well. The Renaissance diversity that is Obindranath leaves more than one person that live in us and with us today and will remain to live through the times that engage with Indian art and modernism. Summed up at its best, I quote K.G. Subramanian, an incorrigible dropout who spurned formal education, but who cultivated on his own effort a deep understanding of all aspects of Indian culture. And imperious guru who overawed his admirers, young and old, but said laughingly that it was just a mask to protect himself. An artist who laid much stress on individual creativity, but marshaled nevertheless an influential art movement, an aristocrat who had the ambition to be a tramp and peered out of the windows of his lofty mansion to read the life on the low down streets, a self-taught writer who had the linguistic facility to express his deepest thoughts and describe his subtlest experiences with remarkable ease and poetry. But it is this but it is that Abhinath who has been instrumental in building, initiating institutions and soon being epitomized as an institution himself and again breaking free from institution in his own indomitable style that we place on center stage today to engage in discussing institution and beyond. It is indeed my privilege to have our speakers amongst us today, Dr. Tapati Gurthakurta, Dr. Jairam Pudwal, and Dr. Shobik Nundi Mujumdar, who is unfortunately unable to be present today due to unavoidable circumstances. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural session titled Institution and Beyond. In no need of introduction, it is my duty to perform the formality all the same. Uh, Tapati Goh Thakurata is Honorary Professor of History, the former Director of the Center of Studies of Social Sciences, Calcutta, and the founding convener of the Jodhunath Bhavan Museum and Resource Center, a unit of the CSSC. She has written widely on the art and culture of modern India and has several visiting fellowships abroad. 
Her three main books are The Making of a New India, Artist, Aesthetics, and Nationalism in Bengal, which was published in 1992 by the Cambridge University Press, Monuments, Objects, Histories, Institutions of Art in Colonial and Post-Colonial India, which was published by the Columbia University Press in 2004, and In the Name of the Goddess, the Durga Pujas of Contemporary Kolkata, uh, which was published in 2015. Welcome, Madam Thakur. Uh, to welcome Jairam Podual, who hails from Kerala, is currently the head of Department of His Art History and Aesthetics and Dean of Faculty of Fine Arts at Maharaja Sarajivo, uh, Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, Vadodara, Gujarat. After finishing his graduation in history from the Calicut University, he joined Department of History, Art History and Aesthetics for his post-graduation in art history. He specializes in Indian I'm sorry. Yeah, he specializes in Indian architectural history and has published many articles on the major Indian sites of Ajanta, Hampi, and Badami. His doctoral thesis titled Caste Segregation in Kerala Temple Architecture, Namaskara Mandapams, a case study, focuses on the caste hierarchy in Kerala and the architectural structuring of the society in Kerala. He's also a guest author who wrote the chapters on Kerala temple architecture for the Encyclopedia of Indian Temple Architecture, published by American Indian Institute, Institute of Indian Studies, and several other publications, including having, ex having an extensive list of international exhibitions curated with, by him, amongst which are Satyagraha, which commemorated the 100 years of the event, which was held in New Delhi and Durban. I again welcome the speakers and now hand over the seat to Jairam Pudwal. Welcome, Jairam, sir. I request you to begin. Thank you, Chatro. Can you hear me? Yes, you're fine. Okay. Uh, thanks to Chatro uh, again for uh, remembering me. And, uh, um, and of course, on this. Uh, occasion of 150 year of uh, uh, Amnina Tagore. Last time uh, I had a conference with uh, uh, College of Art was 150 years of uh, Havel, which I was the convener at, along with uh, Swadi Bhattacharya, who is there. Uh, and of course, uh, when uh, we were working on uh, uh, Havel uh, and that uh, seminar and the papers, of course, we came to know more about uh, Amnina Tagore. And uh, um, as uh, our uh, uh, theme on this uh, uh, conference is on uh, institution and beyond, and how Abhinandana Tagore uh, actually um, contributed to this kind of uh, building of, uh, uh, you know, the institution, especially uh, College of Art, and along with the uh, Indian Museum, Calcutta. Uh, so I'm 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 calling my uh, uh, paper. Uh, the title of my paper is Abhinidhanath and the Defossilization of Indian Art. Uh, defossilization is not exactly correct, but but it is basically uh, you know Indian art was actually before Abhinidhanath and uh, Havel got involved. Uh, Indian art was kind of considered to be a kind of fossil. It is a kind of dead and gone thing. And uh, the, the contribution of Abhinidhanath comes here that, you know, it is a, a kind of revitalization of that kind of uh, uh, or defossilization of Indian art. And uh, interestingly, uh, this year is also the centenary of uh, the major article of uh, Abhinidhanath Tagore, the Shadanga uh, uh, article on Abhinidhanath Tagore, which actually came in uh, uh, 1921. So. Um, so it is an auspicious uh, year, I would say, regarding Abhinandanath uh, uh, issue. Um, 
Now, uh, see, in, interesting thing is that when you look at, uh, I'm not going to talk about Shadanga immediately, but uh, uh, but when you look at uh, Shadanga article and read uh, through Shadanga article, and you know when you read uh, when you look at uh, Abhinandan's work, you can actually see a lot of closeness between them. So it is it's very interesting that it is a kind of a, I mean a partition uh, practitioner is writing on it, and he is actually using that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, elements in. Uh, uh, in his work, and not exactly completely canonized uh, kind of element that you know you don't go away from it, and you know uh, you have to strictly follow the text and all those things. But he didn't exactly do that. He went away from the text, and not in the sense uh, you know the, the creativity did not exactly hamper by the textual uh, uh, you know injunctions. Uh, what he has, I mean, you know, just be put put forward. So, um, and of course, we can uh, talk about lot many and uh, uh, the introduction, the, the, the student, uh, he actually, uh, Niladri, I suppose, he gave some uh, kind of uh, good uh, introduction on uh, Abhinindranath. Yes, we can actually go into uh, Abhinindranath's uh, contribution in various matters like nationalism, revivalism, especially in the case of nationalistic art fervor. And, uh, but most important thing is that he initiated a kind of a, a movement uh, which did not exactly, I mean, the sense, you know, if we had continued that, then the things would have been different. That I'll come back, you know, when uh, we uh, come to that uh, uh, thing. Um, but uh, when you look at Abhinanda, the relevance of Abhinanda in retrospect, that is more important. And uh, even uh, after a century, uh, I am saying this for the reason that, you know, recently the government of India came with this kind of, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is this national education policy. So if you read the national education policy of government of India, which was uh, brought out August uh, 2020, if you read the art and culture portion, which is art and culture, a lot of ideas which, uh, you know, they are saying that it is something which is revitalizing uh, Indian tradition and all those things. Um, interestingly, um, Abhinanda Tagore was saying it, you know, around, you know, in 1900s or 1905, the same thing. But the thing is that we missed somewhere, you know, the, the beginning which he started, we missed somewhere and we uh, misread somewhere, I would say. Um, and uh, uh, it is, you know, uh, interestingly, he is, I mean, uh, no doubt he is one of the uh, uh, it is an indisputable fact that he is one of the first person to think about the new language, new language of art. In the sense, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, this, these two are always, always uh, kind of compared or in the sense uh, when you are talking about uh, Indian art, these two artists like um, Abhinandar Tagore and uh, uh, Raja Ravi Verma comes into the scene. In the sense, Raja Ravi Verma, I mean, the, the images which he used, I mean, of course, he used the thematic, uh, you know, Indianized themes, but he never used the Indianized language, language uh, uh, per se, the style per se. But Abhinandar Tagore is one of the first one to kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, involve in this particular thing. And as uh, uh, his biographers many times say that he has been already, uh, you know, using this kind of language. Uh, and uh, it seems, I mean, Parthamitra, I suppose, uh, talk about um, the, the incident that Ravi Verma visited the Tagore house and then uh, he was not very happy about what, uh, uh, you know, um, Abhinandar Tagore was doing because he was doing something, some art which is kind of related to the, uh, you know, Indian uh, tradition, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at uh, uh, Havel and uh, uh, Abhinandar Tagore, uh, where uh, you know, they, they are actually, they are the first people to kind of uh, try to bring in the traditional Indian art into the art education system. Now, of course, uh, Havel has started the journey earlier. We know that because he's, uh, he, uh, when, he uh, when you read his uh, art education, uh, the article on art education, and uh, he also tried that in, uh, um, you know, Chennai when he was the principal in Chennai. He was actually talking about the craft tradition of India has to be given respect and all those things. But what is the difference here is that you know it was not the craft tradition they were kind of reviving in uh, uh, in in uh, um, 
in Calcutta. Calcutta, where there was this kind of, you know, uh, further, um, you know, enhancement of this particular thing. And uh, um, they, they looked at Mughal art and they looked at the Indian traditional art and Ajanta was, of course, you know, discovered that time and all those things, of course, you know, not discovered that time. But of course, you know, there are uh, writings on Ajanta, then there was an attempt to kind of uh, copy Ajanta. So all those uh, traditions were actually, I mean, of course, uh, uh, Havel also write in his, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, writings about Ajanta. So he mentions Ajanta as a kind of great uh, Indian tradition. So uh, now the thing is that Havel was very much aware of the, um, you know, the, the collection in uh, uh, Indian Art Museum, I mean, uh, um, Indian Museum next door and uh, uh, it's also very interesting that you know Havel wanted to collect more for uh, Indian uh, Museum and he could not he did not have the funds and uh, then he says that uh, uh, the, um, the authorities actually gave him a permission to sell some European work and get some collection or and get some work Indian work and uh, that's the time he meets uh, uh, Tagore. Tago um, so it's interesting that uh, you know when uh, um, you you both this kind of visionaries come together, they what they did is that they kind of revitalize or they try to revitalize the uh, you know Indian uh, tradition and uh, of course uh, Havel has already started uh, uh, demanding uh, his students to go and sketch the sketch in uh, of the Indian uh, uh, works in uh, um, Indian art I mean in uh, Indian museum. Uh, and uh, of course, we have the famous story that uh, uh, Havel actually uh, pushed uh, or uh, threw all the uh, European models in the pond uh, behind the um, uh, College of Art. Uh, then that was a kind of you know uh, controversy and all those things. But uh, what is interesting here is that uh, when uh, you know, even this collection of Indian art was there uh, earlier, the, you know, right from uh, 1814 when Indian Museum was established in 1814. And then most of the excavation which happened in uh, uh, that particular period was kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken to Indian Museum, including uh, uh, 1873 <coughs> when they excavated Bharut. I mean, of course, you know, at the site of Bharut, uh, most of us know that at the site, in near Jabalpur in Satana, there is nothing. All the work of Bharut, the sculptures are in uh, Indian Museum. Um, and if you want to see anything on Bharut, we have to go to Indian Museum. So that was there. So all those great traditions, I mean, of course, uh, you know, there are a lot of Mauryan uh, sculptures in Indian Museum. So all those great traditions, which was great uh, 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 excavations or in the sense, great discoveries of uh, uh, that period was there in Indian Museum. but. Unfortunately, the students in uh, um, College of Art was not exactly allowed to go there or they did not exactly show the interest in that. So um, now the thing is that, uh, you know, it is very interesting that why all of a sudden the language is changing or in a sense why there is a need of uh, language change. Um, and of course, uh, we have to uh, keep, I mean, give uh, Havel the credit and, uh, uh, you know, along with Havel, uh, you know, uh, Abhinna Tagore, whom, uh, you know, uh, Abhinna Tagore actually called uh, Havel his guru uh, in one of his writing. Uh, so here is, uh, you know, the, the elite. He is from the elite, uh, uh, you know, background. Of course, we know that. I mean, he, he came from the elite background. And the elite in India was the problem. I mean, they did not exactly support Indian art. As uh, uh, Havel himself says in uh, his article on uh, art education in India, uh, he says that uh, with the native princes, it became the mark of modern culture and sign of sympathy with the British domination to build and furnish their palaces in the same style. This was beginning of the degradation of Indian art for nothing more hopelessly uh, irreconcilable with the oriental ideas of art could ever have been adopted than the cold formal classicism then fashion in England. So this is in his uh, um, um, book, uh, I mean his article on art education in India. Um, 
Now, the thing is that uh, even uh, uh, Parthamitra says that uh, the Indian pictures, you know, this this kind of uh, disdain for Indian pictures was there in the elite uh, uh, society. And he says that in Abhinandana Tagore's house itself, that there were men's quarters and the women quarters. And all the Indian works were in the women quarters, not exactly in the uh, men's quarters. Men quarters, which was basically public and, you know, people would be coming. So there they had uh, European, uh, uh, you know, artifacts and European paintings and portraits and things like that. But the Indian works were kind of, you know, kept as a secret or uh, kept as kind of, you know, there is a kind of segregation of, uh, you know, uh, those things. And uh, so this was the case of the Indian uh, elite. And of course, we know that the Maharajas of India never bought, uh, you know, of course, especially after the uh, British, uh, the, during the colonial period, they were uh, basically buying uh, trash from, uh, or even duplicate trash, I would say. Uh, not even original works. They didn't buy any original works from there. I mean, of course, there are one or two art, uh, you know, artifacts which came to India, uh, but uh, they never bought any, you know, uh, good new works or even earlier works. So uh, they they always had, uh, like for example, some of the uh, maharajas had collections of uh, Titians, copies of Titians. Uh, then uh, they had uh, Canova, the, the famous uh, Three Graces of Canova was everywhere. I mean, you travel to any uh, palace museums in India, you will get the Three Graces of the, <laughs> you know, Canova for no reason. So, uh, you know, all the kind of, uh, um, uh, what we can say, um, second and second class, uh, you know, works were kind of uh, bought. Uh, by the Maharajas and they never had, uh, I mean, supported, uh, uh, you know, artists, of course, you know, who were actually having a different kind of language. Uh, <clears throat> you know, even the artist has to kind of follow the language of what we can say, the European kind of style. Um, you know, that's why Ravi Verma was uh, kind of supported and not many artists. And uh, e even if you go to, say, the Havelis of uh, uh, Rajasthan, you get uh, this kind of you know, calendar, quote-unquote calendar uh, works. And uh, I was surprised to see the portrait of uh, Queen Victoria in uh, one of the bathrooms of uh, one of the Havelis. I don't know what they have to do there. I mean, you know, so it was, everything was kind of, the facade which we made was of the colonial facade. And we kind of tried to be um, the, the Babus himself. So this kind of uh, um, you know cultural domination that is i mean you know the political domination is definitely was there but uh, what is more uh, um, you know devastating was the cultural domination of the colonial period and uh, uh, when we talk about uh, art also then they they had to kind of come with some kind of language and you know uh, and this language was what uh, uh, you know um, what uh, havel and uh, uh, um, Abhinandan Chagor did that, you know, look at the, I mean, as I said, it was uh, most of this uh, uh, works were actually dumped in the museums. Uh, no interaction with that. Uh, nowhere, nobody told them that, okay, this is part of your culture or something like that. It was, you know, conveniently, uh, you know, uh, kept in the uh, museums and uh, I have to say that the Indian museums, uh, uh, the museums in India, like for example, if you go to Mathura Museum, you don't feel excited about that particular uh, collection, though they have fantastic collections. Like for example, the uh, Kanishka portrait is there, portrait of Vima Kartfes is there, then there are a few Yaksha portraits, which are all great masterpieces of Indian art, but it was completely, you know, almost like, like a storage house, it was kind of kept. And uh, if you go to any museums uh, in India, I mean, you don't exactly get uh, uh, the students who are, uh, you know, involved in uh, studying them and looking at them, or at least look at them with some kind of, you know, interest that is not there. But if you go to any uh, museums abroad, you have to uh, stand in uh, line and to get into the museums. There are the crowd coming into the museum. So, this is, this is something which is, you know, we have missed the uh, bus completely. And this is what uh, Abhinandanad and uh, uh, Havel wanted that, you know, the, the work of art or in the sense, the earlier work of art, kind of having some kind of dialogue or enliven them. 
and I mean defossilize them. That that is the that was the important thing. Um, so um, now uh, when uh, Abhinandan meets uh, uh, um, you know Havel, Havel writes, "I first made my uh, Mr. Tago's uh, acquaintance when I was beginning to form a collection of Indian art for the Government Art Gallery in Calcutta." The government, the gallery at that time possessed nothing but an assortment of European pictures, which to Indian students could not, could only convey that the most bewildering impression of European art. And again, uh, this European art collection did not have the modern, uh, I mean, this in contemporary European art collection. Uh, and uh, he writes in, uh, uh, you know, uh, 1902. Uh, for the last, uh, during the last uh, six years, I have got together a collection of miniature painting of the Mughal school, which is not only of great artistic interest in itself, but should be far more useful to Indian art students than any European collection. Now, this is something, <coughs> you know, he actually thought about. And then, of course, he has to enthuse the Indian art, Indian artist, student, art students, and he has also enthused the Indian art teachers, and he has to also enthused the Indian elite. And when you are looking at this three, I mean, I think Abhinandan Tagore was a key, um, you know, uh, uh, conspirator in this particular uh, uh, thing. Um, so uh, uh, now uh, Abhinandan actually says about, uh, you know, Havel. You know this this dialogue is very very important you know uh, i think uh, of course uh, you know many of uh, uh, you have studied this particular dialogue uh, about between havel and uh, uh, you know abhinandan tagore um abhinandan tagore writes that there was none to compare with my guru havel in appreciating indian art <clears throat> every day for two hours we would sit in a quiet corner while he taught me about Indian sculpture and painting. I think I still think that had not Havel taken so much trouble to teach me to love Indian art, I would probably have remained in the dark without an appreciation of the beauty of the art of my own land. Now, this is very important that they are uh, talking and like, for example, uh, uh, Parthamitar actually brings in uh, an incident that, you know, uh, there was a drawing of a uh, um, uh, Siberian crane by uh, Mansur, Ustad Mansur, a Mughal painter, and uh, he brought it to the notice of uh, Abhinandan Tagore, and uh, uh, Tagore looked at it and, you know, they said, fine. You know, then uh, um, um, Havel gives him a magnifying glass, and uh, then uh, Abhinandan kind of he looks at it and he says, you know, he, he go, go, I mean, he was completely taken uh, aback by, you know, as uh, Abhinandan calls him itself as my third eye. Um, so <clears throat> he, he wonders that why then I did agonize so long about finding proper indigenous material to emulate. Now, this emulation also is a problem. What happened is that in Bengal school, what we did is that we just emulated, you know, what what uh, Abhinandan uh, Tagore said. Like in the sense, you know, if it is Mughal painting, you just kind of use the Mughal language. But the difference here is that Abhinandan Tagore did not exactly copy Mughal painting. Simple. He introduced certain things in Mughal painting or something when he took it uh, and used it for uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, 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 for the Shah Jahan, uh, painting of Shah Jahan, you know, the, the last uh, uh, moments of Shah Jahan, he says that there is, I mean, if it is, it is not exactly a typical Mughal painting. Yeah, I mean, there's one painting which can come closer to that is the famous uh, um, uh, Dukt of Inayat Khan, where the pathos is there, you know, Dukt of Inayat Khan. But the pathos in uh, in the case of uh, uh, the the painting of uh, um, you know the the Shah Jahan painting or the the Shah Jahan last the Shah Jahan the Shah Jahan painting is that there is a kind of 
you know, a lot of pathos which is coming there. There is a element of what we can say Karuna Bhava was there. <coughs> Uh, which is which is not there in uh, Mughal painting, you know. Mughal painting had this kind of uh, what we can say uh, a facade, uh, or in the sense it was it was very illustrative, yes. But the emotions were not exactly there. And what Abhinandanath did in that particular painting is that the emotion he kind of pushed in a lot of emotion there, and he says that these emotions are not exactly you know the emotions of Shah Jahan. Because, you know, just before that, he lost his uh, uh, daughter uh, for uh, some plague or something like that. So he was actually feeling that kind of, you know, remorse in his mind. And he says that he has actually translated that remorse in, uh, um, you know, in, in, in this particular work. Um, so uh, like uh, uh, what Havel says about, uh, you know, this, this approach that uh, he says, Mr. Tagore happily been proof against the temptation to allow his artistic individuality to be cast in a common European mold. He, he, was, he has found in the work of Mughal school exactly the material to help forward his artistic development. Interesting, underlinable. Um, he found in the work of Mughal school exactly the material to help forward his artistic development. He didn't exactly stop at Mughal. He, he took that thing and he took it further. Um, the Indian artist who is, uh, sorry, at the same time, he is not mere imitator of an extinct style of art. Havel writes in the studio article 1902, at the same time, he is not mere imitator of an extinct, art, uh, extinct style of art. The Indian artist who is strong enough to choose the right path has a bountiful reward for there lies open to him a splendid storehouse of unexploited material such as no other country in the world afford, affords. So, you know, he, the, uh, Havel also understand that and uh, Tagore also say that he didn't stop at Mughal thing or in a sense just imitating it. He went further, further, and, and he kind of incorporated into, into those things. Like, for example, uh, um, even Bharat Mata, for example. The Bharat Mata painting of uh, Abhinanda Tagore is one of the very interesting work. And But what happened in that uh, thing? Like, you know, there are a lot of emotions which kind of pumped into it. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of lamentation of that thing is actually there. But unfortunately, unfortunately, when you look at the Bharat Mother image, you know, just type in or your, your Google, you know, now that is the source for everything. So uh, you type in the Google Bharat Mother, <coughs> Nandal, I mean, uh, the Bharat Mother of Abhinandan won't come. The Bharat Mother will come as the, uh, you know, the, the Bharat Mother which kind of made in the Ravi Verma style. Ravi Verma never painted Bharat Mother, but the calendar Bharat Mother comes. <clears throat> that is the image of Bharat Mata, which is kind of you know uh, uh, you know taken up by everybody. But uh, the 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 Bharat Mata, that was not exactly the uh, Bharat Mata which which has the kind of you know the motherness is not there. So uh, now the thing is that and that's why you know when you look at this uh, uh, thing that uh, when we uh, talk about language, the language was not understood. The language was not understood for the reason that. The students were not exactly, uh, you know, uh, understood this kind of uh, what we can say the history of, you know, uh, India or the, the tradition of India. Um, like, for example, uh, um, uh, you know, Abhinna Tagore says about his students, he says, we find few cultural men among the art students here to produce any really good work of art student must go to must be thorough conversant with the classical lore of his country its religious social ideas and uh, the, the episodes of the indian epic and uh, indian epic and history so you should have a kind of understanding then only you understand that kind of language but what happens here is that we don't want to do research that's the problem like, for example, abstraction, you know, uh, uh, the, there were kind of research happening in uh, 
uh, or the, the, not exactly the search, let's say the search happening in uh, West about abstraction and all those things. But we got abstraction free or the sense, you know, we didn't have to think about it. We just took the language. So many times we do this kind of mistake that we just, you know, take the form without knowing the meaning behind it. And uh, this is precisely what happens in case of, uh, you know, when we uh, talk about revivalist movement or whatever, many times we kind of strictly followed or in a sense, we kind of canonized that and, you know, and used it. Now, coming to the canons, um, you have, uh, uh, you know, Amrinda Tagore writing this particular uh, thing, Shadanga, this exactly 100 years back. Now, when you read Sadanga, I mean, of course, I don't want to read any of those uh, things. Of course, you know, uh, uh, people who do not know about, uh, I mean, students are there. So I'm just reading uh, Ruba Bheda Pramani Bhava Lavanya Yojanam Sadrsyam Varnaga Bhangam Idi Chitram Shadangam. Now, this is just two verses. And uh, Abhinanda Tagore actually writes a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, um, article on this particular thing and if you read it and it is easily available in the net just type chadanga you get the whole text it is in the critical uh, thing also um, so uh, no he, the and uh, the the examples which he gives is very uh, you know talking about a cat and a bird in the garden and you know uh, when he is talking about the pranami and all those things so uh, very good examples the examples from the life and he doesn't exactly philosophize it. He writes like a practitioner. And it is very easy for the students to understand that. And when you are looking at, say, uh, you know, Indian aesthetics, of course, we talk about Bharata and Navina Gupta, and, you know, goes on and, you know, huge uh, thing, philosophy and all those things. But when it comes to, say, visual art, visual art, it is very much, you know, the, that, that particular two verses is actually talks about what we can talk about visual art and that's what he brings it so he says that at least read this you know read this and then revive you look at the uh you know the creativity of those uh you know fossil monuments or and fossil uh, uh, images in uh, in the museum so so when you put that emotion into that then this the, the image just starts conversing with you you can actually go into the creative mind of the those you know ancient uh, um uh, not that ancient, but you know the the the, the pre-modern uh, kind of uh, uh, you know <clears throat> the artist. And when you enter into the creative mind of an artist through this kind of interpretations and history, then those masters will talk to you, and that will get you that you know that creativity which you need. Uh, because when uh, we talk about uh, Indian aesthetics in the you know in in uh, um, uh, in art institutions nowadays, people say that I'm a video installation, karne wala hu, main performance, karne wala hu. Mujhe, why should I know about uh, Indian, uh, uh, Indian aesthetics? True, you don't have to, but at least, you know, uh, I mean, in the sense, uh, when you do it with that kind of, you know, it, it has to come from your own mind. The creativity has to be, uh, you know, kindled or there should be a spark of creativity. and doesn't matter when you have that creativity you don't have to worry about the language you know don't i mean uh, as the students are there uh, let me tell you that don't don't start with the material start with the thinking start with the creative spark and that thing will tell you okay produce me in this material produce me in this you know make me a mural make me a video make me a performance whatever it comes from there so to get that you know spark and this this is i mean the two things are there one is this kind of aesthetic uh, theories which uh, abrina says and of course the the early work of art where you use this particular theory it is only a, a decoding uh, a material which is given to you um uh, lastly i would say that you know um <coughs> Uh, now, the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, when you want to follow Abhidhinna Tagore or understand the language of Abhidhinna Tagore, you don't have to follow that language or he never kept a language or in the sense he was going on experimenting with the new language. 
But problem what happened is that we got stuck to that in that language, and stuck to that. I mean, so when you get stuck in the language and a, you know a different kind of approach, then then we can say that that is a time where it becomes canonized. That's the time it becomes you know patthar ke lakhir or in a sense you don't change it you know. But once any idea, once it gets you know. Uh, what we can say uh, uh, into a kind of stone, or in other words, when it gets fossilized, it loses its, you know, vibrancy. And uh, um, you know, as I said earlier, that the 2020 national education policy actually takes that, says that we should actually have more uh, monumental visits, we should have more craftsmen coming in, we should have this, that, you know, Indian tradition or whatever. This has been, you know, they are saying, I mean, Abhidna Tagore is saying, I mean, was saying this in, you know, almost 120 years back. And still we have to create an education policy to say it to the educationists in India, saying that, no, 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 bring in the heritage and all those things or protect the heritage. Now that dialogue should have been done much, much earlier. And if that dialogue would have started, like for example, Abhinna Tagore did that in 19, I mean 1900s, but it did not exactly percolate, you know, to, to other areas of uh, India. What percolated is the language, in the sense that kind of canonized language was percolated, but the idea did not exactly travel across and did not exactly make a uh, kind of a impact. So what happens? Unfortunately, the majority of Indians, for the majority of Indians, the Indian art remains still fossilized in the museums. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take much time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Purva. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, taking us through the fossilization of Indian art and bringing us to what you say is need for new language without canonization. With that, I will uh, request Topati uh, Gurthakurta to take over. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chhatrapati. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen because unlike uh, Jairam's talk, I am going to speak with images uh, and I'm going to take you through some of them. So let me just begin by putting my opening screen up there. Um, can it be seen? No, no, no ma'am, not yet. You have to share. Okay, let me just go into share screen. Then. Just one minute. Uh, Yeah. Yes, it's done. Let me now see. So can you now see? Yes, you can go to full screen now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let me begin by thanking. So I can't see myself and that's the best way to talk. Because when we normally teach or give a lecture, we don't continuously look at ourselves. Uh, so I'd rather just have images on the screen. Uh, I'd like to thank Chhatrapati and the authorities of the Indian Museum for thinking of me and bringing me to speak on this occasion. Um, I always feel I have nothing new to say about Abhinandanath, and there is so much to be written, so much new to be discovered about this person. So this, in, uh, the seminar today is called Reimaging Abhinandanath Institutions and Beyond. I think Abhinandanath has long been in need of a rediscovery. He needed to be brought out of the small uh, space of nationalism and Indian style painting with which he came to be linked in history. And I myself, when I wrote on Abhinandanath, 
right at the beginning of my kind of entry into the academic career, also looked at Aubameyang primarily through that lens of Pradeshi nationalism and Indian style painting. Jairam Badhuwar has already taken us through some of this, these campaigns against the decrepitude of Indian elite taste, their fascination for poor imitations of European art, and the need to reorient the Indian public and the Indian elite to the wonders of the Indian art tradition. Now, in some ways, what Jairam Podhuwal told us was really taking us through a lot of the rhetoric that Havel, Kumaraswamy, Obanindranath, and others presented us with this binary between uh, the entire prior traditions being one of degeneration of taste, from which Obanindranath then provides the spark for a new aesthetic and a new movement. Now, in my work, I actually tried to scrutinize the rhetoric rather than take it at face value. So there I do stand slightly in a different position to that of Jairam Baduwal. I also took a great interest in all that he said was crap that was being collected, all the popular works. I was interested in a broader setting of westernization, of patronage, of colonial art education, of the new social worlds of doing modern art inducting new technologies, within which ultimately Aubameyang became only one last chapter, where I placed him in the context of a new Indian style movement that he pioneered. Having said it, I needed to say this because since then, my book came out now a very long time ago. Since then, there's been a lot of foundational work done on Aubameyang, which has allowed us to really look at his works as a whole, much of which was never in the public domain. And I'm going to come to that right at the end to say that Aubameyang worked in multiple modes that went far beyond the scopes of this Indian style painting with which his name and his early career came to be linked. So in a way, that will be one of the thrust. But on the other hand, I'd like to stick quite closely to the theme of institutions and how do we think of a figure like Aubameyang, who, as we read about him more and more, we realize how he resists being tied to institutions. He resists being institutionalized. And as Chhatrapati said, in a way, over time, he becomes an institution in itself. But so his link and affiliations with institutions, nonetheless, are something I'd like to rethink on this occasion. I'll begin with his birth date on John Mashtami. Aubameyang was born on John Mashtami, uh, which that year happened to be 7th August. Uh, and in some ways, his deep fascination with the legends and myth of Krishna uh, bookend the beginning and the end of his careers in painting. Uh, so uh, what we see here are two works in completely different visual modes. On one hand, an early Aubameyang when he's grappling to find a language of its own. He is not satisfied with the training that is being given to him by his art teachers privately. He's looking at late Mughal miniatures of the Delhi Kalam. Uh, it is doubtful that he has access to Pahari miniatures in this early state. Uh, and, but nonetheless, he is fascinated by the legend and the myth of Krishna. And here I'd like to separate the household of Avanindranath, which is five number five uh, Dalakranath to go lane from the house of Yobindranath, which was very Brahmo, and not into several religious and ritual ceremonies. On the other hand, the home where Avanindranath grew up was suffused in a world of worship of devotion. From Kirtan to Kathakata to 
a series of jatra and other performances link them quite closely with these other ritual and living cultures. So having said that, so Abhinindranath is therefore repeatedly returning to the theme of Krishna, the Krishna, the child and his exploits as a child. So on the left is an illustration from Joydev's Gita Govinda, which is called the Krishna Lila series. So we know that later when Abhinindranath's work is catalogued uh, by Mukul De, and later when Vinod Bihari makes a chronology of his paintings, they are put into these distinct sets and series with which Abhinindranath works. On the right is a work of a totally different kind, when, where Abhinindranath in 1938, almost at the end of his pictorial career, this is in fact the large major series that he paints. After that, there are works like the Kuddu Jatra, the Katum Kutum series of sculptures, but in a way, the Krishna Mongol and the Kobikon Kunchondi series marks one of his large series. When he turns to the Mongol Kampo, when he turns to folklore, and he turns to a totally different pictorial mode that he draws from the local Potochitra traditions. I dwell a bit more then on this theme of the child Krishna and his exploits, which continue to obsess the later Rabanindranath, to which he returns in this set of paintings for which we have exact dates, 1938 in July. Uh, and he takes you through Krishna's vanquishing of different demons from the Kaliya to Kagashu to Putana and all of them. Now I begin with this introduction to Mark Janmashtami and Abhinindranath, who was born then, and the theme of Krishna. But the real uh, emphasis on my talk will be on the two institutions which Jairam referred to, uh, the Indian Museum and the Government College of Art, Calcutta. We see them almost as adjacent structures. They were connected internally. They were part of a complex. Uh, and they, were, they come up within a few years of each other. So the art college is previously at Gorenhatta in North Kolkata, and it is relocated here, possibly in the 1880s. I don't have an exact date. And the Indian Museum moves into this building created by Walter Granville, which is inaugurated in the 1870s. Now, these two institutions, which are today hosting this seminar, were actually very crucial to Abhinindranath's early entry, if we could say, onto the map of Indian art history. Abhinindranath then leaves these institutions behind in a way, but they are very formative and they remain very important to understanding Abhinindranath's emergence, the patronage structures, and how, even though he is, becomes this great nationalist figure, how ultimately he's very closely tied with these early colonial institutions as a space where he's drawn into to study Indian art and later teach also. So I like to think of the Calcutta International Exhibition, which is held in these premises, again, a foundational event. The new building of the Indian Museum comes up. The Government College of Art building is also by this time, possibly in place. And we have the Calcutta International Exhibition, Calcutta's biggest world exhibition. In fact, this is Calcutta's great exhibition, taking place on the Calcutta Maidan in front of the new building of the Indian Museum. The reason I refer to this exhibition and is to see how this exhibition and the exhibits that came in here become quite crucial to the plan of a new art section that would bring together the artwork codes of the exhibition into the Indian Museum. You have the economic and art section that begins. Uh, you then have the government art gallery, which has already been 
in place since 1872. So the government art gallery is inaugurated when the government art college is still school then, is still in Goranhata. The gallery moves to these new businesses. So there is now a talk of an integrated sec art section that would link the collections, the fine art and craft collection of the Indian Museum, not the archaeology section, with the government art gallery. And the two institutions come to be linked. So one interesting thing is that the principals of the art college then occupy the building which is now the director's office in the Indian Museum. So in early Havel's photographs, you see that building as being the place they were. I'd also like to place these two figures who already Havel has been widely referred to already. That would there be an Auburn Indranath without Havel? Uh, perhaps it would have, but we don't know. But clearly there's a Guru Shishya kind of relationship that emerges and Havel is very instrumental in making Obanindranath, giving Obanindranath his first boost internationally, and later Percy Brown, because Havel leaves the art school due to illness and never returns. So it's really under Percy Brown that Obanindranath spends much of his time in the art school as vice principal, in a way, gathering around him his first group of students. Now, before Obanindranath comes to the art school, Obanindranath is being trained at home, uh, which I think uh, the student uh, who presented on Obanindranath mentioned, Gilhadi and C.L. Farmer, who are his art teachers at home. He's, of course, not happy with the training. But what this period produces is a large body of pastoral portraiture that Obanindranath paints. And there is a Tagore portrait, which is now in the Bose Institute, which is also from the 1890s. And this is of his son, Olokendranath, to whom his whole collection would come later. Uh, and it is apparently sent for display at the Paris Universal Exposition of 1900. So Obanindranath is being drawn into the folds of these early colonial exhibitions. And I think we need to understand this rather than to think of these huge breaks that, of course, art history has positioned these breaks, but I think the entanglements are also important to go through. Now, we know that it is under Havel that Auberlin Granat begins to closely examine the wonders of Mughal miniature painting. Jairam already told us about how it is Havel who brings in miniatures. So today's much of some of the Indian painting collection that today exists in the Indian Museum date back to Havel. He does get rid of the copies of European painting. Uh, it's doubtful that he dumped them in ink pond. A lot of them actually circulate in the art market. A lot of what the Jorashako households sell in terms of their European art also finds a market. So we should not undermine the fact that European art and its copies continue to have a large market. Uh, whether we call it degenerate taste uh, is another issue. And I've been interested in the broader range of art collecting. But Obanindranath's real product of his close perusal of Mughal miniature painting under Havel's guidance, where he looks at them through large magnifying glasses, are really these two paintings in what is called his Mughal history series. The Mughal history series is remarkable for a number of reasons, but I'd like to take you back in time to the fact that the second of these paintings, the more famous one called Passing of Shah Jahan, where Obanindranath famously talks about how he combines Mughal craftsmanship with the bhava that he felt was lacking, right? So he brings interiority and emotion, a modernist move into the structures of Mughal miniature painting. Now, this is important, but when we look back at the Delhi Darbar exhibition of 1902, where Obanindranath is awarded a medal, it's very interesting that he's placed there as a miniaturist, 
alongside a Delhi book binder who's also getting a award. And it is in some ways an anomaly. Obanindranath is reinventing himself as a miniaturist, but within the space of the colonial exhibition, he could pass off as a miniaturist. But it requires Havel, Kumaraswamy, Sister Nivedita to actually position this as a work of modern Indian art, which draws on the Mughal tradition. On the left is the work that he more directly copies in the Mughal mode, including the youth of Wash, which is Abhinindranath, supervising the building, to this which becomes now a classic and canonical piece that signposts Abhinindranath's entry and the, his career into becoming India's national modern artist, replacing, in a way, a figure like Ravi Varma. And all of that has been written about. It's also interesting that Obanindranath is turning to Mughal history and turning it, making a national allegory out of it, right? So the cosmopolitan and the syncretic worlds that Obanindranath belong combined Persian, Sanskrit, and Bangla. And the turn to Mughal history via Mughal literature, I think, does stand out very much. He's one of the earliest artists to actually render the Taj Mahal into elements of Mughal history. Uh, and the second painting we see on the right directly resonates with Rabindranath's own beautiful poem on Taj Mahal as a teardrop on the cheeks of time. Now, this is Rabindranath in the art school, uh, surrounded by his first group of students. It's one of the few photographs we have of Abhinindranath as teacher. Master Moshe would be Nandala. Abhinindranath was a guru teaching. So the figures we can identify, all the figures here are identified, but those who become uh, important within the larger movement is Oshi Thaldar, Kitindranath Majumdar, Shoilindranath De, of course Nandala Bos. K. Venkatappa, who comes all the way from Mysore and returns. Hakim Muhammad Khan, who we never hear of really again. Shottendranath uh, Dotto, uh, this is somebody called, I have to get the name, again, somebody who I had not heard of. I think Durgesh Toran Sinha. And this is Shurendranath Ganguly. In my book, I wrongly put it at Shurendranath Kaur. He dies very young. Now, this photograph is one of what we have of Abhinindranath's time as a teacher. And while Abhinindranath will always say that he was very reluctant to be brought into an institutional job, he was used to working on his own terms. To be made a vice principal meant he had to get up on time, get dressed, get into his gari, come. Abhinindranath was not one who was given to these routines very easily. But nonetheless, when Havel brings him in, he does come. And I think this is where, in some sense, the movement that grows around him is born. And Abhinindranath, in some ways, enters public art history. That had already happened when Havel wrote about him in the studio when he won the medal at the Delhi Art, uh, in the Delhi Darbar exhibition. But it's really in the art school where Abhinindranath is given the freedom to work with students on alternative forms of painting. That, in a way, the movement is born. I'd like to show you some images we have from Havel's collection. So that today, when you go into the art school, I've never really been able to unearth an archive, which I'm sure exists there. I could not do it in the 1980s, and I've not been able to do it now that I've come to the end of my career. The art college has always been not a place I could enter and find things, though I'm sure it has a huge amount of material. But Havel, these are things that were part of Havel's own collection when he went back to England, never to return again. So we see here then one of the key teachers of Indian style painting, Ishwari Prasad, 
who compared to Oban Indranath is always the artisan and the craftsman who learns how to grind, who teaches students how to grind colors and work. He's coming from the Patna Kalam. And this work that we see, some student work that were in Havel's collection that his daughter gave to the VNA. So this is an early work by Shurendranath Ganguly, and this is a mythological composition by Nandalal Bose, which is still unfinished, but they all have inscriptions which tell you that they're done in the art school in the Indian painting class. Now, it's also worth thinking that one of the first institutions and persons to be collecting of Anindranath is actually Havel. And now they come into the government art gallery. And today they're part of the Indian painting section of the Indian Museum. So in some ways, these two twin institutions, the Government School of Art and the Indian Museum, are quite central in what we may understand as placing Auburn Indranath in a public domain. He becomes a teacher, students gather around him. His work, even as it's being reproduced in journals like Probashi, Modern Review, uh, Bharati, they are also being collected and they enter the Indian painting collection that has already been set up, which has already had the miniature paintings that Havel had acquired, where Avadindranath's works also go. So some of his early works from the time before and after he entered the art school, such as these two paintings, both canonical uh, of his illustrations of the Ritu Shambhar, are part of this early collective. So I don't want to get into a deep stylistic analysis because that will take us a long time. But we can see here again of distinctive styles that is, has emerged. One, which is called Obisharika, but the title is Obishar, where he works with backlighting, Pahari miniatures, to create this figure of extreme delicacy and finesse. And on the right is where he's emerging with his wash technique, which he develops through working with the Japanese artist uh, Yokoyama Taikan, Hishida Shunso. And later, there is Katsuta. Before Kamporai, there's Yoshio Katsuta, who actually is brought in to the Jorashako house and then to the government art college. I'm going to quickly run through just two more of early Obunindranaths, which are collected. So these are his illustrations again. Again, he is entirely kind of cosmopolitan in the what he chooses from the Sanskrit Kalidasa's poetry to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam to later Arabian Nights and several other texts. So this is again important because these are commissioned illustrations for Fitzgerald's translation which is ultimately published in 1910. But the paintings that he produces for these, again, are collected. And they come into the Indian Museum. That history would be very interesting to look at in the Indian Museum accession files to see exactly when these Obanindranaths are coming in. Havel leaves by 1906. But nonetheless, obviously, there is a collection that is growing even under Percy Brown, when Avanindranath is the principal. I'd like to dwell on this one early painting of Avanindranath, which is in the Indian Museum collection, which is clearly from his time when he used to come and go from the art school. It's called Abdul Khalek, an art dealer on Park Street. There's a lot of art dealing going on. Uh, the Indian Museum is a place and the Government College of Art where dealers are coming with objects, Indian art objects, Persian art objects with miniatures. Uh, it would be important to research who Kalek was, but it's also one of Abhinindranath's most beautiful portraits in this delicately miniaturist, naturalist style. If you look at his face, he could be part of the world of the Arabian Nights, but his face comes out to tell you that it's a person he knew. And he places him in this mythical setting of urns 
and sculptures in the background. So he belongs to a distant land almost from where things come. But he's actually sitting there right there in Park Street. And Jura Shakur is also a very, very important center which is emerging for collecting Indian art, Southeast Asian art, Tibetan art, and so on. Uh, so what, what, do we, what does Aubameyang then leave behind at the art school? We know that he's there from 1905-06 till he finally leaves in 1915. But by 1912, there are differences between him and Percy Brown, and he's very keen to leave and form. There's an alternative forum which is emerging. But this fresco painting remains. It was recently being discussed in another session on Aubameyang, which happened on 7th August uh, earlier this month, which is his illustration of Rabindranath Vidayo Bishop, where he's working in the fresco technique. And we see a very, very different kind of stylization that is already emerging. So already there is no one stylistic uh, thread with which to tie Aubameyang. Already in the early 1900s, we can see him working in all these different modes, but still largely illustrative. And all his life, Aubameyang could work, make this idea of the artwork as illustration, drawing heavily on literary texts, legends, and poems. Now, this Aubameyang today remains in the premises of the Government Art College. Uh, I believe it's part of an upper room, but it would be good to know, I think, where it was initially located. So these are the kind of detailed histories that we need to explore as scholars. Aubameyang, what he leaves behind is a bust which is made much later, which is now occupies the central courtyard of the Government School of Art. It appears much later and he's a bit lonely out there, uh, really, where he stands there. Uh, what a legacy is also that of Indian painting. We know that the Indian painting departments continue. There's a neat division, which is hard to often retain, but remains between Western style painting or academic class studio, in which does life study, still life, landscape, and the Indian painting. Uh, we don't know. We have no provenance for this photograph. I got it through the uh, website. Uh, it's clearly an Indian painting class, and these are Japanese artists. So this could be from the time that Yoshio Katsuta is there, or from the time Kampoara is there. Because Kampoara is really based in Kolkata and in Jorashako, comes to the art school before he goes to Shantani. So these are Aubameyang, in a way, direct legacies that he leaves behind. And the legacy of Aubameyang, nonetheless, will return to the art school in many, many different ways. When Mukulde becomes the principal, when Rabindranath Chakraborty comes. So, but Aubameyang himself moves quickly on. And the Jorashako House, uh, as is well known, and the new Bichitra Club that is formed within it, becomes the alternative site but it's also an institutional site. And I think I'd like to emphasize this, that when, they, when he moves away from the art college, so the Bichitra studio and his time and the art college overlap. But parallelly, the Bichitra studio begins. Uh, there are, Nandalal begins to teach in the Bichitra studio. The first art classes begin there. But more important is this famous, now very famous sketch we have of the Bichitra Salon. It's a salon in the modern sense of the term. And here I'd like to say that Aubameyang is not just a pioneer of a new modern art movement uh, that goes under the name of Bengal School. The movement and Aubameyang, Gogoneyang and others also are founding some of the major institutions that will support the world of modern art. The studio, the salon, where critics meet, collectors come, where artworks are discussed. So art criticism, uh, art collecting, the art salon, 
the place of teaching and the place of exhibiting. So in some sense, Bichitra Studio and then the Society of Oriental Art in parallel, which had been set up in 1907, emerged as these alternative institutional sites for supporting artists, training them in alternative modes, and becomes a very major forum of exhibiting too. Now, this is a time of joviality, of camaraderie, but look at the Tagores who all lie there. So this is a very interesting notion of leisure outside the work of discipline. You paint and you work on your own terms. The critic is there, your followers are there. You read, you sleep, you paint on your own terms. So this is Dokkhin and Vananda. I thought it'd be wonderful to be able to juxtapose this with an actual photograph of an afternoon siesta. So yes, there was a lot of leisure, sleep, and relaxation, even as they were work hard at work with, and this epitomizes, of course, the aristocratic lifestyle from which Abhinindranath comes and which he likes to hold on to as this treasured space of creativity and art practice as he moves away more and more from formal institutions. The Bichitra Club, however, is also a place of intense activity. It runs, it's Gobindranath, his brother, runs a photographic studio, a lithography printing press from which his satire journals will come. Uh, this is a self-portrait that is so Bichitra Studio becomes this alternative site of intense creative practice that goes across medium from painting to photography and of course theater. We know that it's a very major site for performance, both the Bichitra Studio and the outer courtyard, where many of Robindranath's plays are staged. In a recent talk, we had Anandalal and Devashit Banerjee looking closely at stage setting and how Abhinindranath and Gogonindranath were very closely involved, both as actors and as stage designers, in these worlds of the performances at Josh. So here is Abhinindranath in Palguni uh, with another of his students, Monindra Bhishan Gupto, who goes to Colombo. So Abhinindranath's students, as he says, begins to now move in the second decade of the 20th century, again to institutions. They move to art colleges across India, right up to Lahore and down to Colombo. You have a spread of this movement through Abhinindranath students who are spreading out. But meanwhile, Yorashako is this lively place of performance, poetry, plays, painting, art collecting, art criticism, and discussions. The world of performance spills over into much of Abhinindranath's own art. So again, by now, Abhinindranath is moving in many, many different directions of work. So the Roti Kamdev are from what is called his Jatra series, uh, and they coincide with this time when Abhinindranath is relocating almost entirely from the Government Art College to Jorashaku and Bichitra Studio, which becomes an institution in itself of training and of bringing uh, various kinds of cultural connoisseurs to the board. Now, much of these Abhinindranaths, which I'll be running through here, are in a way never quite in the public domain because unlike the early works which were collected and some of the mythological paintings that continue to be reproduced, it is these other dimensions in Abhinindranath's work that I discovered when the, I opened the trunks at Robindra Bharati Society and the material came out. These works had seldom been published, but today, Thanks to the works of Arshiva Kumar and Devashish Banerjee, today they have been very closely scrutinized and brought into the space of art historical analysis. So here is a world of performance where he's drawing on Japanese kabuki theater, local jatra performances to create a whole series, which he calls his open air play series. The mask, I began with the mask. If I could just go straight back to it. So when we are re-imaging Abhinindranath, I thought one of the ways we could begin was by the way Abhinindranath re-imaged himself 
in the May 29, 30, he turns his own portrait into a crumpled paper mask, like a maquette, and re-images himself. So Abhinindranath, after the 1915 period, when he leaves the art school, increasingly moves away from the public domain. He is involved with Vichitra, with the Society of Oriental Art. He even goes to Shantiniketan. And soon after that, Nandala will be joining Kala Bhavan in 1920. Uh, so his students go directly first to Ashit Haldar and then Nandala join the new institution in Kala Bhavan, which will take Indian art in wholly new directions. But Aubameyang's mask, so another series that is very, very closely tied to the worlds of performance, where he turns them into these marionette heads. Shishir Bhaduri, well-known actor, Aryan Aryakam, again, uh, possibly a Southeast Asian student would also, I'd like to know more about Aryan Aryakam, and maybe one can find out more. So this is the mass series of 1928-30. There's the Arabian Nights, now seen to be by far his masterpiece series. It's done in 1930 in the course of a single year. He produces his huge body of work, taking us deep into the legends and reinterpreting the Arabian Nights for his contemporary times. Now there's no one better than Shiv Kumar who has told us about these paintings and I would refer everybody to both his talks and his writings on the Arabian Night series. Uh, but again, when I many years ago was looking at Auburn Induna, these were surprises. They were, I had not seen these in the public domain. They were coming out of trunks and we were looking at them with a faded catalogue trying to identify them. There is also from the time he does the Krishna Mongol series, these works also called the Playmate series, uh, again from Hitopadesh. So, and so we are looking at Aubameyang continuing with his uh, kind of nostalgic script in Bangla signatures. That becomes a continuity, but we see how his work moves from the miniature to the folk from the detailed and intricate to pastel shades and to other kinds of more impressionistic work. Uh, I think that is the end of the slideshow. Okay, so now if I can stop sharing screen and just round up with a few things I wanted to say. Uh, and how do I do that? Let me just see. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure I've overshot my time. I'd just like to end by saying uh, the afterlife of Aubameyang's works in institutions. I just end on that note because Aubameyang did not sell very much. In fact, hardly sold his works in his lifetime. What Havel acquired in the early stage are in the Indian Museum. Uh, there are works which are acquired by the patrons of the Society of Oriental Art, uh, and some of that exists in collections abroad. But all of Aubameyang, when Aubameyang passed away in 1951, far away from Jorashakho, giving up the home which was sold, he dies in Boranogor. The family actually had almost all his works from the very earliest to the very latest. Now, where does that work go? Uh, I had a student working on the National Gallery of Modern Art Formation, and Aubameyang still alive when the first collecting is beginning, and they're trying to get Aubameyang. In fact, Aubameyang is selling higher than Aubameyang. And then these are things to consider, you know, in the fifties. But very little of Aubameyang of course, moves into any public institution. So Alokendranath Tagore gives it over to an institution which is set up 
in the number five house where they lived, which is the Robindra Bharati Society. Almost the entire collection with a catalog by Mukul De is given over. And along with Gogonindranath's work, some Shunoini Devi, some Mukul De, but really almost the best of Gogonindranath and Gogonindranath, fortunately for us, goes into a single collection. That collection is not in public domain. All of us who worked on him know how difficult it was to see the work there. And it is important to announce that this Rovindra Bharati Society collection is today on permanent loan in the Victoria Memorial. I always tell Jayanta Shengupta that Rovindranath would be appalled to see his works in the Victoria Memorial. And I think Jairam would agree with me. That is not an institution that he would have ever wanted, perhaps, his works to a very unlikely place. One would have thought the Romindo Bharati University Museum, which is next door. But these trusts never got on with each other. So there was no question of handling. So Jura Shako is ideally where Obanindranath should entirely be on this way. Instead, it was, but they remained in trunks. Till they did move, I know that during Calcutta's third centenary, Ganesh Haloi organized an exhibition where some of Obanindranath came on view again. And then now, some years ago, they've come into the Victoria Memorial, where we hope it will become part of a large Indian painting gallery, hopefully on the centenary year of the memorial too, because the Victoria Memorial came up in 1921. So there are many centenaries here, Sharongo, Victoria Memorial, Aubanindranath 150th. And maybe we are coming full circle in decolonizing a colonial memorial if we can bring Indian painting, both what the memorial itself has and all the Aubanindranath and Aubanindranath material back there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kapuli, uh, uh, for taking us through such a wonderful journey, beginning from John Mashtumi and uh, Aburindranath's engagement with Krishna, right up to the Vichitra studio and uh, the following up of what was happening as painting, photography, and theater. Um, I think. Uh, for paucity of time, we will now. I think we don't overshot our time by a lot. Uh, which, was, which was but quite enlightening. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I planned on a 15 minute, when Chhatrapati told me, no, we have one person who cannot come on, so feel free to speak. Yeah, so thank I you took that freedom very literally. No, no, it, it was really wonderful so that you could at least complete your presentation. Uh, we would now like to see if there are any questions uh, so that we can engage our audience. Um, Krishanu, um, Minmoy, are we uh, ready with any questions? Are there, uh, by the time they come in, uh, let me just add that it was wonderful that uh, even uh, Shiva Kumar was brought in uh, to engage with Abhinandranath by Subramaniam, who also uh, happened to uh, visit the uh, Rovindra Society's uh, uh, trunks while he was going back to Baroda uh, long back ago and while he was asked to present a paper at Kola uh, So the history somewhere uh, carries on and um, uh, fortunately, uh, those paintings are now in such a uh, wonderful publication that we have for everybody to refer to. I would like to ask the people responsible for the questions, are there any? Should we, uh, should, would you like to come in with any of the questions? Uh, Krishanu, yes? Yeah. Uh... Thank you, uh, Dr. Jairam Padugal and Tapati Go Thakurata for the wonderful and enlightening lectures. I think I'm audible. Yes, sure. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah. 
So I think um, there will be a lot of questions that will be following up, and without further delay, I will request the listeners to type the questions in the Google Meet chat box. And for the people who are attending the session through the GCC Facebook page, can also put their questions so in the comment section, and, the, and they will be communicated to our speakers respectively. The floor is now open. So do you, do you already have any questions that are in? Uh, right now, I don't see the question in the Facebook page. Uh, at the Indian Museum end? I'm looking at the... No, sir, there are no questions as of now. They're not really questions. They just say that they've enjoyed it, etc., etc. Right. So, there is a question. There is a question. Yes. Yangi Shukta, I think. Yeah. You mentioned Abhinav. Could you There is one uh, question from Jairam. So Jairam yeah. mentioned Abhinav. Yeah, yeah, yeah reading it. Uh, yeah. Abhinav has thought about what a uh, student should read. Could you please give a concrete example of this text? Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, he actually said that the student should read the aesthetics and history. I mean, there is no specific text for this. You know, is it okay? Because, you know, uh, he talks about that the student should have understanding. I mean, that's what you should mean. This yeah, I think uh, just to add to that, I think one of the things that Abhinav clearly mentioned in his reports was that uh, since uh, we, we actually go, have to go back to that time and, and try to see as to who were the students who were coming into the art college and possibly what Abhinav was referring to there was that he may need more literal, literally uh, more educated students, students who were aware of their history and culture, and who were, uh, you know, uh, uh, aware of the epics, uh, so that they could go back and refer, and rather be uh, not sort of void of content in that sense. Yeah. So there is no there is no specific text as it. I mean, could I quickly comment with a point? Uh, yeah. You know, Abhinandanath is always in his own writings showing a very healthy distrust of teaching, though he's a great teacher. Uh, he sees in his very famous text called Bharat Shilpo, he believes that Indian art is not something that can be taught. He believes he imbibes it. So it's a very kind of romantic and spiritual notion that it's not something taste cannot be taught. You'll have to learn how to see it must come. So there's always this kind of continuous denial of pedagogy in a way, even as he is really a pedagogue. So in some sense, when he's writing Sharam Gold, he's writing Bharat Shilpo, he is producing a set of canonical texts, but he himself is never tied by them, nor does he actually recommend that they become teaching Channels, that these are the texts you read so that you become skilled in Indian aesthetics, right? He does believe that, yes, it is important, but which comes first, creative practice or the textual canon, is something he's continuously debating. So I think, again, what we haven't done, and I think this is something I would like to think about, we haven't really given enough space and time to Abhinandranath, the writer and the art theorist. We look at Abhinandranath, the painter, even art theorist, partly through a close study of Chorongo, Murti, and Bhagishwari Shilpa Prabhupada, one can do. But Abhinandranath, the painter, writer, from right from Bura Angla and Kiret Putul to Bhutkotu Deshe to his later works like Mashi and uh, Khatan Chir Khata and all of that. You know, when I'm looking at his later painting, 
writings, and you look at the later Obanindranath's writings, satire, humor, joviality, uh, become very, very important part of it, right? When he's turning, he's throwing, he's almost throwing away his career as a modern artist and say, I'm going to do Palagan. I'm going to write my Kuddu Jatra. I'm going to make art out of nothing. Right. He is in the state of continuously reinventing his place, moving away more and more from saying, I'm going to now work only for children. So that is very interesting. And yet we today, when we return to each and every phase of his work, there is so much that, so much of the pedagogy which is implicit through his doing. So I'm even thinking of the, when he puts together a collage book like Kudru Chakra, or when he does the Krishna Mongol series. Obanindranath is deeply invested in matching textual narration with visual narration. So for instance, how does one do it, right? So later Bengal school trading would say, people would narrate stories to us and tell us to paint, right? So you hear a story, you paint a story, right? How do you do it? At a time when modern art had left this illustrative mode far behind. There's nonetheless this deep engagement with the literary, the mythological, and this world of text image correlation. And I think this is something that needs to be written about. And I think it needs to be done by somebody who can look at his painting and his creative writing together and his extraordinary memoirs, which is not writing. They are being written by Ran Chondo, but the detailing of it, you know, in terms of bringing alive the world in which he lived. I think Jarashakur Dhare, Apun Kotha, and Horowar are extraordinary resources for anybody wanting to work on that. So one of the things maybe we can all plan to do, if we have the full year, is to bring Obanindra the writer and Obanindra the artist, Obanindra the art theorist, and Obanindra the raconteur of memory together. And we can we have to see how we do it. We will need scholars with different kinds of skills here who are coming. And that's what I would really love to see happening. Uh, in, we've had, we've written a lot on his nationalism, his leaving behind. But the richness of that oeuvre is really still not found a composite attention. Shiv Kumar does wonderful work with the painting oeuvre. But there's also the other things to be brought together. So it could be a volume that we could, and I think it should come out from this city, right? We sh it should not be coming out from anywhere else. It should be coming out from Kolkata. And maybe we can start working towards it. So this is an appeal to all of you here, especially those who are heading institutions, to bring some of us together to begin this work. <coughs> Uh, uh, there is a question uh, from uh, Aniruddha Acharya. Um, okay, this is for uh, Jairam sir. He is saying that if the notion of nationalism in the context of Abhinindranath was different from how the current education policy is about. So if you can please illuminate please. So your microphone is off. Mike. See, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, the notion of nationalism and uh, current education policy, I don't think we should enter into that, you know, because, uh, of course, the, the only reference I said that it was part of the nationalist uh, fervor, uh, which uh, Abhinandana actually suggests that the cultural nationalism or in the sense, uh, the, uh, you have to have a understanding of your culture that actually creates, uh, nurtures in the natural nationalism. So, but uh, I, I, I don't think we should get into the education policy uh, issue in that because education policy has this thing that, you know, uh, cultural, natural, natural, I mean, nationalism is kind of, you know, propagated here. Uh, I think we should stop that. I don't think we should enter more into the cultural na uh, nationalism or current cultural nation nationalism that way. Uh, I, I hope uh, Tapati agrees with me. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, I was a bit uncomfortable when you began. Of course, Obanindranath is talking about inculcating a deep awareness of 
uh, India's own architectural art traditions, everything. But there is no way in which he makes it a agenda in terms of neither a political agenda nor a majoritarian agenda where only some parts of heritage will be thought about and not others, right? So he is thinking, in fact, he almost sees himself as belonging to the world of the lost miniature artists. So if anything, Obuninganad relocates him in the late Mughal era. He takes himself back there. The others are drawn much more to Ajahn Dhanon. So I would say that the present day curriculum and the ways in which it wishes to inculcate Indian heritage is another matter. I think Owen Indranath would stand quite far from many of the positions that are involved in this. And nor is Owen Indranath ever really interested in drawing up national and school. You know, he's, so one thing to remember is he is an institution by himself, as Chhatrapati says, but he's really not involved with the nitty gritty of running institutions. And that's the big difference between a Rabindranath and an Obanindranath or a Nandalal and an Obanindranath. Obanindranath self-consciously chooses to remain in his own insular world, which is not insular, it, it opens up to the world at large. But it's from that space that he operates. And he ceases to be a guru because he no longer has students. They may come to him occasionally. And his brief time at Chantiniketan, when he does become Achanchu, is there, but he comes away again quite soon. That's important because that's when he's narrating, recontering stories, the memoirs get written. But in a way, Obanindranath, I cannot see him drawing up any art curriculum at all. You know, he would he was not into that thing at all. So yes, I think uh, what we take away from Obanindranath in terms of how we think about a large syncretic heritage is, is a different lesson. And I think that is something that can come when we learn, we read more of Obanindranath, we look at more of Obanindranath. Okay, uh, 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 Jairam sir and uh, Papatidi, uh, for both, there is a question from Devashish Khodri. What would be the possible reason behind waning of Abhinindranath's worldview from the arena of present day art curriculum? Uh, Abhinindranath's worldview was waning even in his own lifetime. You know, he was out of sync with his own times. And I do say that. Uh, he deliberately shuts off the contemporary and withdraws. And yet he belongs to the present. He's painting right into the 1940s. But he's not engaging with any of these movements that, is, that are happening around him. So Abhinindana to be discovered needs to be drawn out from a shell into which he very willingly moves. So in some ways, it is already he's living in an anachronistic time zone, if I may say so, you know. And that's the great melancholy of the later of Bonindranath, when he has to give up that home, when he has to give up his favored world, and the reality of moving does hit him. He's a great art collector too, and you know, that collection today is actually in Gujarat. It's in it's with the, the Kastur Bhai Lal Bhai collection. So Abhinindranath, there's much of Abhinindranath to be continuously recovered and retrieved. So what the Kastur Bhai Lal Bhai has is actually a bound red book with Abhinindranath and Shogunindranath. Abhinindranath is gone by then. Actually detailing 300 paintings, which they sold to the Lal Bhai collection. And think of the detailing of the work he does. So this is on the eve of the house being sold and in moving. So, you know, the worldview uh, is a different worldview, and in his own time itself, that worldview is being torn apart, right? There is so much happening around him, and Aubin Indranath has retreated. And of course, today, I wouldn't even know how to bring that worldview back uh, into a curriculum, except to say we engage with the work, the writing, and many others of that time. Though you've brought us to nearly a sort of a, a end of Avinrat in terms of his work, and but I still have one small uh, thing I would like. When when Avinrat is 
here in this college uh, and post Percy Brown. Uh, I think in 1909, the uh, Oriental Art Society is being formed. Uh, is there, is, is, is it one of, is it because he's not no longer comfortable in the institution that things come up at the Oriental Art Society where he begins to teach and that is where uh, major of his students are really uh, taking his, uh, or working under his tutelage? I don't know whether um, uh, you, whether you'd like to come in. Uh, you know, the beginning of the Society of Oriental Art, Aubrey has some concern with sort of Rodinand because its patronage is heavily British, but they're all great champions of Indian art. So, like Havel, there's Woodrow, there's many. I forget their names. There are many others. And they're all actually supporting the new art movement and against older curriculum and taste. It's parallel. Uh, I think the classes at the Society of Oriental Art probably begin a bit later. Uh, they're parallel more to the Bichitra studio, but one would have to look at their detailed history. It's initially set up almost like the India Society has been set up by William Watson's time as a place for championing a cause. And that, I think, is parallel to the Gurash Salon. I think that's a Chomobaya mansion. So it's close to the art school, if you think of it geographically. I think a lot of the early discussions and all are happening there also. So I think a detailed history of that society and its place, it exists, but we think of it as we know that they're holding exhibitions. I know that that will begin on very early, by 1908 and the exhibitions begin. Many art classes begin. There's somebody called Ritharilal Mahapatra, who's a South Indian traditional sculptor or, uh, from Urissa, sorry, Urissa sculptor who's brought in to teach traditional forms of sculpting. Yeah, he begins sculpture. Yes. Yeah. So I think they're parallel, and then the Japanese artists are coming, they're both in the art schools. So I like to say that maybe the world were not so completely set apart either. If you think of that area then, the Japanese artists are moving between Jora Shako and the Government School of Art, the Society of Oriental Art and the Government Art College are not far from each other. There's clearly conversations. And then when Obolinonat leaves, the Jora Shako studio becomes the main kind of thing. So I think Obolinonat does not set it up. It's set up really by figures like Carmichael, Woodroff and others. And it's set up very much as a space to support the art movement, which by then already has taken a certain shape. And it's very much also then about, you know, things like Lady Herringham's visit is through India society to the Orient. Well, the Kolam Hoban doesn't exist. It comes to the Society of Oriental Art. And it's from Vichitra studio that Oshit Haldar and Nandalal go there, right? So in a way, they are functioning as parallel institutions too. Thank you. Uh, do we have? Yeah, there are, few, yeah, there are a few more questions from Facebook page of GCAC. So um, I think this question is for Taputili. And the question is posed by Bila Shendu Shiv. Wanted to know more on Abhinindranath's pedagogical vision and continuation of the same in GCAC later. Uh, yeah. Who is the person asking the question? Yeah, was it audible? Yeah, I heard the question. Uh, actually, you know, what the Indian art pedagogy in the government art college is and whether Auburn Indian art would even have approved directly of that pedagogy is something worth asking because this Indian painting doesn't go away. So it's interesting, Auburn Indian art leaves, but by that time, there's enough demand clearly, as we saw in that photograph, for parallel strands of pedagogy to flourish. So I will not be able to tell you very much on what kinds of teaching methods would be pursued. But when Jairam is talking about the fossilization, I think it is in the art school perhaps that it becomes a bit more fossilized. Because clearly, people come to the government art college to learn academic training. It's very, very clear when you look at now 
the memoirs of a lot of people that the government art college is valued for the solid academic training it provides and the great platform it gives you for becoming a professional artist. Now, in parallel, the Indian art movement is also growing. So actually, I really don't even know who become the main teachers. And these are questions that would be interesting because through the 20s, our Indian art students are heading art schools all over India. And they're beginning, they're beginning a proper pedagogy in terms of how to do painting that is outside the format of life study, you know, uh, classroom kind of detailed work. Do they reject it altogether? Do they blend it? I think these are details about pedagogy and curriculum that could be written not just at the government college of art, but many of these other institutions to which these students go. Kala Bhavan is what we know of most. But for instance, Colombo, where Monindra Bhushan Gupta goes, Shomarendranath Gupta, who becomes the teacher of Chuktai in Lahore, Oshit Haldar, who goes to Lucknow, Shoilan Yonad De goes to Jaipur. I think the art colleges in the 1920s are all undergoing various interesting shifts and coming in of new departments. But that's not a history that's been written as yet, but we hope it will get written. Yeah, I, just, just to add to that, Kapuri, I think to answer that question a little further, actually what happened, uh, the division in the what was then divided as the fine art course and the technical design course were, happened only after Avindranath left. Yeah. So actually, uh, Avindranath is not even aware as long as he, because there was only one fine art section as long as Avindranath was in this institution. It is only in the 20s again where this is being broken up into two divisions and possibly when uh, Percy Brown is also there. So. Yeah, there is another question from Kulsta Bacharjo. Uh, I think it is for Tabuti, ma'am. So, you want some references for books? Yeah, so yeah. What I'm going to do is just type them into the chat box, right? Uh, basically, I refer to Devashish Banerjee's book and Shiv Kumar's, but I'll type it in if you want. I think I saw that. And there is uh, like another question in Facebook page. I think it is posed by Rajot Shin. So I think it's a broader question about how Abhinandanath Tagore is being positioned in Indian art history. Being positioned in? Indian art history. Ah, that would take another webinar, right? <laughs> uh, I think some of what we said is, you know, in art history, of only of early Abhinandranath figures, right? So when you write the history of art, it's almost chronologically. By the 1920s, the focus shifts to Shantibhiketa. Then it shifts to Rabindranath, who begins painting in the late 20s. So the sites of modernism move. And Abhinandranath is no longer, as I said, a public figure in by choice he's no longer a public figure so a lot of his works are not he's not teaching he's not selling his work he's not exhibiting his work and his works are not being reproduced in journals too so it's as if art history left him behind and moved on and I call it the kind of conscious stepping out of history that he does, which is why you're right that in Obanindranath in art history still exists as the person who Havel discovers, introduces to Mughal miniature, who gets his awards, who then founds the movement, the story we've all gone through. But to recover the larger Obanindranath is often to say, this is an Obanindranath which doesn't belong to any movement or to any institution or to any decided school of art. He exists as an individual. I think Gogonendranath too, his career is cut short very early. So here are people who are individual modernists and who need to be positioned. But in a way, there have been individual monographs written on them, and that is a form of positioning. Uh, but so I think the field looks very different from the time when I entered it in the 1980s to now when there's been, and you, you know, when figures like A.G. Subramaniam takes an interest in Abhinandranath, who was, had been left behind as a revivalist, right? And K.J. Subramanian wishes to return because Binod Bihari, who trained him, is writing 
very very creatively on Abhinandranath through his you know his essays, his chronology, his Adhunik Shilpa Shikha. So in a way, Abhinandranath's memory is something that Vinod Bihari inculcates and passes on to Manida, and Manida passes it on to Shiva Kumar. Right. So what an amazing inheritance. Unfortunately, I was none of their students. I wish I was, you know, so in way my entry would have been very different. Uh, but uh, but it's good to think that in a way, Auburn Indranath has been reclaimed for Indian art history. But how you would position him within a school? How much of a modernist is he? I think these are questions that can still be answered. Uh, um, there is just one question, one short question I would like to ask, like two couple three actually. So in your lecture, like you have uh, mentioned two prominent shifts of Aurindranath, one from the institutional setup of Goblin School of Art, and and later towards the uh, shift of Aurindranath to the artist alone in Jurashatra. So I would like to know, like uh, whether this particular shift of the artist has impacted his artistic expression in some way or not. That's you know hard to say, um, you know whether because you know in a way the salon and Chorachako and that uh, the Indian Society of Oriental Art are grown in parallel while he's still in the art school, but increasingly his heart is not there. Or at least that's what he says when he's recounting those years in in Jorashako Dhare. He's saying he wishes to move away now. Uh, also, he had trained his first batch of students. He sees them now moving into careers of their own. And the Society of Oriental Art and Vichitra Studio is a more hospitable space for him to operate in. So one of the very interesting set of works that emerged from his deep involvement in the activities of Bichitra is the Jatra series, for instance, his Palguni series, where one can see him getting now moving away from myth and legend into a series of other kinds of performative traditions, cultures. So in a way, he gets tied up with the world of the Bichitra studio very much. But I wouldn't be able to give you a very clear answer in terms of what it brings about in terms of a major, because he continues to work in a variety of modes, as we see, always small scale. He does one very large painting, which is hardly known of, which is called Alamdi. It's like a triptych painting. It's his only very large work. And it's in the Kala Bhavan collection. Uh, again, we don't know. It would be lovely to look at that work again and closely analyze it. Again, a very moving image of the aging emperor reflecting on the debacle of you know, an empire that is about to collapse. Uh, so Obamindumat to him is no kind of fundamentalist kind of bigot. It's a it's a reflection, and I like to read it alongside Joduna Chalka's work on Aurangzeb. So you know, one can do a lot with bringing Aurangzeb in conversation with other important figures who are writing, rewriting the nature of history. So I, it's hard to say that any stylistic shift is directly linked to this, but uh, certainly the play series, uh, the mass series all come out of that deep involvement with the world of performance, theater, stagecraft, education. And I think that angle could be explored. Think of Gogonindranath's own work. How far the Bauhaus impacts Gogonindranath, for instance, we don't know. We know it has a certain direct impact on Gogonindranath. But so what is what are the carryovers will be hard, but it's worth exploring. That period is worth exploring again. The, the paintings of, say, 1912 to the you know, up to the mask series, up to, up to say the Arabian Night series. It's a kind of uh, the time from his leaving up to the time when he does this masterful series, and then he stops painting for a long time, and then he returns again in the late 1930s. Well, I think uh, we have overshot uh, time in every sense now. And uh, 
it, it is time that uh, we conclude this session. Um, I think it's been wonderful to have both of you take us through the different facets of Abhinath as educator, artist, and part of institution and beyond. Uh, I would now uh, ask Shatidi to please come. Shatidi. Yes, good evening to all of you. We have come to the end of our lecture session, uh, the inaugural program of the mounting the one two at but University of Abhinav. Actually, I was transported to Chacho. Uh, could you please move? Pardon? Please mute your face. The echo. And so. Uh, actually, uh, I was so enthralled and so engrossed in the lecture that I simply forgot that I also have to give this, uh, have to do this formal thanksgiving. Uh, but it was really a very enriching experience. Thanks to both of you, Jairam and Tapotidi. It was nice meeting you after such a long time, though, on a virtual platform. We always enjoy listening to you, but Tapadidi, it was really wonderful. And uh, the things that you had been talking about, looking at Avonindranath, both as a painter, as a writer, that is very important, I feel, because I was thinking when you, was to you were talking about uh, the establishment of Oriental Art Society, I was reminded of what he has said in Ghodwa that uh, I got tired of people emulating me and I wanted to make painting easy for people and now it is like the demon in the myth who are, who are just trying to eat me up. So it's better that I would stop. And that is very interesting. I'm just reminded of this and he's, and apparently he opted for... Can you see you, you. Uh, Shakti, please? Can you put no, your camera? I just wanted to share this, just one point that about Bichitra Studio, he says that when Oriental Art Society becomes like government art school, then I didn't want to work there. So these are the things I was reminded of. Sorry for diverting from my duty, but uh, I just wanted to share this. Please pardon me if I have gone beyond the boundary. No, no, I just, Shati, we wanted to see you. I think you're not getting my point. Can you please put on? No, no, no. I'm, not telling you. I'm not telling you. I know we're quite late. I know. Now, we'd like to thank the museum authority for collaborating with DCAC on this project, and especially director, Mr. Origit Dr. Choudhury, and uh, Shayan Bhattacharya, the education officer, who has devoted so much time uh, for us and uh, aided us in a fruitful collaboration. And I think I thank Professor Chhatrapati Dotto, Principal Government College of Art and Craft, for planning and ex executing this project and, of course, moderating this wonderful session. And I'd like to thank the whole team of all our colleagues, Shojit Dash, Krishanunath, Minmoy Dev, for their honest and eager cooperation. And on the museum side, it's Rit Borua and Urijit Kaur who had. Uh, given us the technical support, but, and last but not the least, I must mention my young colleague, Deep Govindo Choudhury, who has planned the poster, who has given us all kinds of technical support, and who has always been there working for the success of this project. So I thank you all, and of course, all the students and the faculty members who has directly or indirectly helped us executing this uh, almost a dream project because um, we have got their cooperation whenever we have asked for. And by being present and encouraging us, they all have given us a big support. And uh, we are planning to have many more lecture sessions like this. Keep an eye on our website. And once again, thank you, Tapotidi and Jairam, for this wonderful lectures. I'm really enthralled, and maybe I was carried away a bit, and that's why I went beyond the institutional boundary. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. It's been a long and wonderful session. And we look forward to having you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jairam, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.